I'm sure you were as excited for Ryzen as I was, or even more so. AMD coming back to relevance in the CPU market? Yes please! Intel needs to be rattled and challenged. Competition is so good for the industry, and for us, the end users. And now, on paper, according to AMD, I could get a proper 8-core 16-thread CPU for just over $300, and it has 24 PCI Express lanes, and they have an unlocked multiplier, and only 65-95 to 95 watt TDP? Absolutely! I'll take it! Intel's been getting ridiculously audacious with their high-end desktop chips, meaning uh, I'd pay $1,700 for a 6950X? I'd rather build an entire system for that price. And thankfully, now with AMD, that means I can build a true 8-core beast machine with Crossfire 480s and be well under budget in over-delivering on FPS. So here's the lowdown up front for this specific video. I was given the 1700X CPU from Wootware to benchmark as well as the ASUS Crosshair 6 Hero motherboard to do all of my testing on. I'm going to be doing a general review of the chip as well as focusing on the gaming aspect of the CPU in this particular video. I'll have other videos coming out soon detailing other scenarios in which you could use Ryzen in. Leave a comment down below with your suggestion on what you want to see. And be sure to subscribe to stay tuned for future videos. So first, before we get into gaming benchmarks, let's address synthetic CPU benchmarks that AMD was showing off at their event. And here's where all of the technical junk will be so that you can compare my data against the data of other reviewers. All of my comparison information will be against the i7-7700K, since that's the closest comparison Intel CPU I have access to, and it's the one with the closest price difference to the 1700X. I think the 1700X is $50 more in the US, and then only 400 Rand more here in South Africa. So for all of the testing, the 7700K was run at stock, meaning the 4.5 gigahertz boost clock was active, and the 1700X ran at its non-XFR boost clock of 3.8 gigahertz. I also did testing on the chips when they were overclocked, with the 7700K pushing 4.9 gigahertz and the 1700X hitting 4 gigahertz. If you want me to address Ryzen overclocking in a future video, let me know. It was not easy to get this chip to 4 gigahertz, I can tell you that much. So for RAM setup, I was using 32 gigabytes of G-Skill Trident Z RGB, graciously supplied by Wootware, running at 2666 megahertz on both systems, since that's the highest official frequency supported by the Crosshair 6 at this stage. And then finally, everything was run on my Windows 10 test bench, which has games, antivirus, and a few other apps installed, so it's more of a realistic gaming scenario than just a fresh install of Windows and running everything with nothing else in the background. So, first benchmark up, Cinebench R15, it does remarkably well in multi-threaded mode for the 1700X, a 63% increase at stock settings over the 7700K, but in single-threaded, Ryzen is 19% slower. Not terrible, given the 700MHz clock difference between them for that test. Overclocking both the chips gives the same general percentage differences. Cinebench 11.5 gives very similar differences of a 67% gain by the Ryzen 7 proc in multi-threaded mode. I mainly did that test for redundancy reasons to validate R15, but it holds true in that instance. Moving on to HWBot's HEVC X265 video encoding benchmark, Ryzen again does really well, especially since there's no apparent hardware accelerated encode and decode setup on the Ryzen chip. For the 1080p benchmark, the 1700X comes in 15% faster at over 40 FPS and in 4K mode it is 17% faster with a 9.45 FPS average. When the chips are both overclocked, the difference is 14% at 1080p and 15% again at 4K. HWBot Prime shows a 12% lead for the 7700K both at stock settings as well as while OC'd. Geekbench 4 is next with stock settings, showing the 1700X trailing by 19% in single-core performance, but beating the 7700K by 17% in multi-core. The overclock setup pushes the 7700K's single-core victory to 21% and decreases the 1700X multi-core victory to 15%. 
W Prime 32, testing both speed and multi-threaded performance, gives the 1700X a 26% victory with the 32M benchmark at stock and a 25% difference while overclocked. Then finally, testing 3 d Mark's CPU performance both in Time Spy and Fire Strike gives the 1700X a 47% advantage at stock in Time Spy and 45% while overclocked. Fire Strike gives the 1700X a 40% victory at stock and a 33% victory while overclocked. Now, as far as Ryzen's IPC or instructions per clock, that is how well it performs at identical settings to the 7700K, I did a few tests with that as well. I reduced the 1700X to four cores and eight threads at the stock 3.8 gigahertz, but had to leave cache the same and lowering the 7700K to 3.8 gigahertz while maintaining the same core and thread count on that chip. And that resulted in these benchmarks. Cinebench 11.5 has a 1700X running 8% slower. Cinebench R15 is running 11% slower. HWBot X265 gives the 1700X a 30% loss, but again, remember no dedicated hardware for Ryzen 7 for that particular benchmark. HWBot Prime is another 30 plus percent loss. Geekbench 4 shows a 14% loss in single core, slightly better than at stock speeds, but also causes Ryzen to lose the multi-core by 15% as well. And finally, W Prime 32 shows a 14% slower time than the 7700K. So it appears that the instructions per clock isn't on par with KB Lake. It's about 10 to 15% or even 30% in some benchmarks, which is fine since AMD never claimed that Ryzen was going to be on par with KB Lake in that regard. All right, now I can hear you shouting at me through your electronic device or monitor or wherever you are. Get to the gaming benchmarks already. How does it perform in games? Well, let's talk about that. For testing the games, I ran a single Zotac GTX 1080 amp from Wootware and ran every single game at very high settings without anti-aliasing at 1080p. The reason I'm using a GTX 1080 at 1080p is because that's the most likely scenario in which the GPU is no longer the bottleneck and the CPU is. Both chips are at stock with these results, so 4.5 GHz turbo on the 7700K and non-XFR boost 3.8 GHz on the 1700X. So let's take a look at what I found. Synthetics up first. Time Spy gives Ryzen the overall win with a 400 point advantage, overall hugely due to the increase in CPU score. Fire Strike, on the other hand, isn't as gracious with the 1700X losing by 300 points since the combined test hit Ryzen a bit harder. Ashes of the Singularity, run in DX12 to show average CPU frame rate, gives nearly identical frame rates of 63 on Ryzen and 64.4 on KB Lake. However, the average CPU frame rate is 25% lower on Ryzen, but as you can see, Ashes of the Singularity is still GPU bound even at 1080p with the GTX 1080, so there's little concern with that CPU bottleneck at this point. Middle Earth, Shadow of Mordor runs at 0.2 FPS lower on the 1700X, but the minimums are about 10 frames per second higher. Hitman in DirectX 12 shows that the CPU average on the 7700K is 100 FPS, whereas the 1700X can hit 103 FPS. Ryzen gives you about 3% better performance here. Grand Theft Auto V, which happens to be the most CPU restricted game I tend to benchmark, shows a 1.4 FPS gain in favor of the 1700X, but that's barely even a 1% increase. A win's a win, right? Rise of the Tomb Raider in DirectX 12 gives the 1700X nearly a 5 FPS gain, pushing the average frame rate to over 100 FPS, but it also managed to bring the minimum FPS up by a significant amount as well. And then finally, in the tough on CPUs Total War Warhammer, the 1700X hits its largest lead with a 6% victory over the 7700K. Not too shabby. All right, so let's break this down to more practical terms. If you have the 6700K or 7700K, I see no reason to upgrade to Ryzen for gaming. There might be some games that can utilize the extra cores better, but the lower clock speed also hurts the 1700X. And even if you have a 6600 or 7600K, I don't see much reason to consider upgrading. Again, for gaming alone, since in all the testing that I've found, those i5s can keep step with the 7700 k for the most part. But if you've been holding off on upgrading, sticking with AMD, rocking an FX8350, or anything below Haswell Intel, I'd say Ryzen 7 is worth it. Ryzen is good. 
Sure, it may be smart to wait for the Ryzen 5 if you know you'll only need four or six cores with eight or uh, 12 threads and just want to have an i7-like experience, but Ryzen holds up against the best consumer gaming chip on the market right now in the most CPU-bound scenarios I could muster. And if you have anything less than a GTX 1080, you're likely gonna be fine. Plus, you'll then have the extra cores for anything that you might do it on the side, like Discord or Skype or whatever you have open while you're actually gaming. Tempering that excitement though, the clock for clock matching of Ryzen is still behind Intel at this point, which may matter to some of you in either the games that you run or the applications that you utilize. Just know that it appears to be roughly about 10 to 15% off in the synthetic scenarios that I showed. It also appears that overclocking is a bit difficult on these Ryzen chips, hence the different SKUs with varying frequencies. I wasn't even able to hit the XFR frequency of the 1800X on all eight cores with the 1700X. I had to make sure I disabled cores to even be able to touch 4.1 gigahertz. But then tempering that critique, the only way AMD really has to go from here is up. If they can increase IPC on the next iteration of Ryzen, it should just continue to get more competitive. There's a lot to like about what AMD is doing for us, the consumer, bringing a lot of the benefits of Intel's x99 platform to the power user without bringing all of the costs that are associated with that. And considering that the way of the future seems to be higher core counts and more games are starting to actually utilize more cores, double the core amount for the roughly the same price could make it so you don't need to upgrade for a while, especially if you're running on something less than a GTX 1080, as I mentioned earlier. And by the way, Gamers Nexus has done a really good video on Watch Dogs 2 and its utilization of more CPU cores, and you can check it out in the corner over there. Unfortunately, I haven't incorporated that game into my testing suite, so you'll have to check out their coverage for that content. Now, getting back to the games that I benchmark, there are some results that can lead to sooner bottlenecking, such as Ashes of the Singularity, where the CPU bottleneck was only 12 FPS higher than the GPU average. The GTX 1080 Ti or dual 1070s or dual 1080s might be able to push you past that mark, but also I'm more inclined to believe that if you're running those cards, you're not running at 1080p and therefore the CPU will not be limiting you as much. All right, so now I'm going to conclude with this. The Ryzen 7 series of CPUs isn't an obvious choice for everyone. It may not be worth upgrading for some, it may be overkill for others, or you still need the extra PCI Express lanes and quad channel memory that Intel's high-end desktop provides. Regardless, the thing to celebrate here is that while it may not be an obvious choice to pick up Ryzen, it's at least another choice. AMD has regained relevance to be considered as a legitimate option for an enthusiast gamer's new rig. It basically matches the 7700K in every instance that I could find in my testing suite, and I see no reason to not pick one up. Now, I haven't had a chance to check out either the base 1700 or the higher end 1800X, but leaks and rumors seem to indicate that the only real world difference is clock speed, I, but I could be completely wrong because I don't have access to other reviewers' NDA information. So, if you need higher clocks, then the 1800X might be the way to go, but I would only expect to get 1 to 200 more megahertz. Again, that's just from leaks. Obviously, that information is actually out there right now since you're watching my video, so go confirm with other sources because I only got one chip. But with that, I want to thank ASUS South Africa for sending over the Crosshair 6 for all of my testing, as well as for Rootware for providing the 1700X which I put down right over here, the Trident Z RAM, the Zotac GPU, and basically everything else that I use for my testing. If you're in South Africa and want to upgrade to Ryzen, be sure to check out Wootware for the great prices for both the AMD components, but also the rest of your system's needs. With an amazing customer support staff, vast selection, and some amazing country exclusives, Wootware should be your go-to store for rising your system to the next level. So if you're in South Africa, head on over to wootware.co.za to boot up your PC. The link will be in the video description. Thank you for watching my video on the 1700X. Hit that like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts on Ryzen and AMD down below in the comments. But please, by all means, keep the discourse civil and don't resort to ad hominem attacks. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of my tech-related content, including more Ryzen stuff, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers.